ಸ್ನೇಹಿತರೆ ನಾನು ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ನಲ್ಲೇ ಮಾತಾಡಬೇಕಾಗುತ್ತೆ ನನ್ನ ಕನ್ನಡದ ಗೆಳೆಯರು ನನ್ನ ಸಹಿಸ್ಕೊಳ್ಬೇಕು ಐ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಕಮ್ ವಿತ್ ಅ ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ಡ್ ಪೇಪರ್ ಆಲ್ ರೆಡಿ ಟು ಗೋ ಬಟ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಲಿಸ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ದಿ ಫ್ಯೂ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪನ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಮೀ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಡಿಸೈಡೆಡ್ ಟು ಗೋ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟೆಂಪ್ ಐ ಮೇ ಡಿಸಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಯು ಅ ಬಿಟ್ by talking what sounds negative uh, let me explain i am a theater person and if i am uh, any interested in uh, sustainability it really started with theater you know in theater you cannot do theater unless you are very very sustainable there is no money in theater you know in 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 theater everything has to be redone recycled and you have to do shakespeare again and again kalidasa again and again so so it is in our blood and then i also became more and more interested in uh, sustainability and uh, about uh, 38 years back i got tired of uh, delhi of the big city and uh, shifted my base to a small village called egoru started working with uh, the handlooms uh, for about 30 years i worked so intensely with handlooms that i almost forgot my theater work i forgot delhi i forgot bombay and uh, eventually this cooperative of uh, rural uh, below poverty line uh, poor women has now become the largest producer of naturally dyed handloom in the country has a capacity of about 30 to 40000 meters a month but uh, there is another aspect to me i am also a scientist i used to be a scientist doing uh, research in uh, kanpur iit before i switched sides and became a theater person so this two opposing things makes me sometimes realize certain things and feel very sad about it. for example i now know that this world is not going to sustain when mr siddaramaiya our dear chief minister said uh, talked about stephen hawking and about that particular book in which stephen hawking discusses uh, the problem of humanity and its survival he was talking of a man who with utter unemotional uh, style he declares that the humanity is not going to survive for more than let's say five decades stephen hawking gives five decades for our survival and i have started to feel that we have even less time to really survive but it did not make me feel unhappy because i realize that if something is going to happen which is beyond me i thought how do i respond to it i said well i still have to live and i still have to live the way i want to live and so i am quite happy and i'm continuing to do what i'm doing but with much less tension and much less less pressure on changing the world all this as i said came extempore because i was listening for example to all of them but especially this man who was talking about uh, the, the the change in the human heart and all the while when i was listening to him i see oh my god it takes so long to change hearts it took gandhi ji so long to change hearts it takes everybody to change hearts and to construct organizations changes even it takes even more time to construct organizations do we really have the time we don't think i don't think we have the time as a scientist i know we don't have the time so what do we do 
You know, we, we have been talking theory here. We all know theory. We all know how to build a civilized society. But we also know that the only problem with this society is that it is too easy, too luxurious. We are asking people to give up luxury. We are asking people to give up easy life. And the only time when uh, an animal did not uh, have luxury and easy life was when it was not accessible. The greatest thing about nature, the greatest thing about an animal is that it is bound by its limitation. An animal is bound by its limitation and that is why it is God. We say nature is God. Why is nature God? Because it is completely bound by its limitation. A fish can only swim, a, a snake can only, you know, quill like that and a bird can fly. But a bird can't swim and a you know, fish can't fly. That's when nature is fine. What happens when you get your hands? Which is what bothered Gandhiji and Buddha and Basava and Sri Ramachandra the most. They all knew, Bible knew, that the moment the hand came into existence, there was danger. In Bible, there's a very clear story of of God telling that, look, I like you, but I am not uh, happy. I am very, very worried. And then exactly what uh, he was worried happens. You know the story of the Garden of Eden and all that. Right? But then we have moved millions and millions of uh, kilometers away from the Garden of Eden. You see, the Buddha, the Basava, the Kabir, the Nanak, all of them happened before automation. They all said great things when automation wasn't there and they were trying to control, trying to make people civilized. Sometimes it even worked. Often it didn't work, but sometimes it worked. But what happens after automation comes into being? Gandhi's significance is that he is the first saint after automation or the last saint uh, before uh, you know automation became a big thing in India. He's a transitional figure and he manages to remain as a saint incorporating automation into the, uh, into the larger problem of civilizational construction which Buddha, Basavarna, Sri Ramachandra, all of them had done. So we know that Gandhi is the solution, if at all there is a solution for the global warming. We know that Gandhi is the solution, if at all there is a solution for uh, the moral crisis, ethical crisis, social, economic, every crisis. But are we able to achieve that? You know, I, I heard, um, you know, the main speaker feeling so unhappy about what is happening to Gandhian institutions. It is true. Gandhian institutions have become exactly like the priest becomes after the temple gets established and every ritual is established. He goes on doing the ritual and he gets submerged in the ritual and the structure becomes more important than the dynamic idea. This happened to Christianity, this happened to Hinduism, this happened to Gandhi. So I think we should try and generate a metaphor. We may succeed, we may fail. But let me tell you, by just organizing numbers, you are not or I am not going to get Gandhiji uh, into reality. Gandhiji was never numbers. He was always metaphoric. As some of the speakers very correctly put it, the congressmen never agreed with the best programs of Gandhiji because they thought that he was a foolish man. Sal Satyagraha they thought was a foolish program. But Sal Satyagraha succeeded because it was the most amazing metaphor and it was implemented, the metaphor was implemented with utmost commitment from those 78 people who went with Gandhiji. And then the 78 million people joined him. So, 
So the problem really lies in converting once again the structured Gandhiji, the formal Gandhiji, the Gandhiji in books, the Gandhiji in ideas, the Gandhiji in theory into a metaphor. We have to do that if we can. How do we do that? I don't know. Let me end my, because I have, there are many other speakers also, I don't want to talk for too long. Uh, after doing uh, Charkha for about 38 years, I realized that it was now running, more or less running. Not the best way I would have thought, but it was running, so I thought I should get out. I should be the old man poking one's nose into the affairs of an organization and not allow them to commit their own mistakes. So, last year I moved out of Charkha and I was thinking, where do I go? I have lived in the midst of the most beautiful Western Ghats region, the greenest part, and where do I go from there? I decided I'll go to Bombay because that's the real opposite that you can find in, in India. And in Bombay, let me tell you of something very interesting that is happening. Not many Gandhians, not many bureaucrats know about it. You know, in the last two, three decades, young people are dropping out of cushy jobs, dropping out of happy homes, and dropping out and getting into what? All are getting into or wanting to become actors. You know, this is something like what used to happen during the independence movement when millions and millions of young people were going and becoming uh, great freedom fighters. Or like the 70s when uh, they all went to become noxalites. Today, they are all becoming uh, aspiring actors. And let me tell you the horror story, the other story, other part of all the beautiful things. In Bombay, in uh, Varsova, Andheri West and uh, what they call Mud Island, Fishing Island, at any given time you will find 50,000 aspirants living sometimes four in a room in the most obnoxious condition ever. And they Initially, I used to be very cynical because I thought they were all going there to become film stars. And then I realized that they have nothing else to do. They want to express themselves. And some of them, a lot of them in fact are Dalits, a lot of them are girls. They go there wanting to express and the moment they see some teacher, some, somebody like me, they just throng there and they want to learn, they want to express. This is also independence movement. I want to tell you that what is happening in Bombay is an irresponsible uh, say, you know, situation where we have not looked at as, a, as an independence movement. Every family is suffering this. In every family, at least a girl or a boy has decided to drop out. The whole family is worried. They are spending huge amounts of money to stop the boy or a girl from going there. But this girl and a boy has gone to acting. So, I have decided to spend time in that uh, ghetto. I call it the actor's ghetto. The Warsaw, uh, you know, uh, and there West. And maybe I will find a solution. If I find, I will definitely share it with you. And with this positive uh, note, I want to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. August galaxy of scholars and thinkers on the dais of the dais. It is my privilege, opportunity to be here with you and share my views. In fact, uh, I came with a PowerPoint presentation because once you don't have power in a speech, then you make a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> but after listening to you, I dropped the idea. I thought I should share some 
there's three thoughts that I have in my mind. Of course, a few things uh, for the reality I will try to share my concern as well. <coughs> If I have to confess myself, I am not a man who should be here. I don't know Gandhi. I try to understand part of it. When my mother spun wheels and I got good. So I was introduced with Khadi economics in my family itself. The second stage came when my father was with the Bhutan movement, a co-worker in the field. I could have a sense of that struggle where he could find some solution or pieces of lands with some of the poor people. And third stage came when I joined Gandhian Institute of Studies Baranasi, literally started reading. Earlier I thought Gandhi was simple, but when I started reading Gandhi, it became more and more difficult for me to understand. Being a student of economics trained in social science research, I tried my level best and hard to put the Gandhi in that frame, and I failed. Because he cannot be put in those frames. Somebody said he is a practical idealist. Others said he is an evolving man who learns from day to day life, theorize his concept, bring it back to the people as a praxis. Still he says that he does not know anything. He, he gets something from the society, so he is not saying anything new. And then, gradually, I thought it is very difficult to understand Gandhi, can I try to understand myself? So that search is going on. And here I am again to learn from you people here listening these two days. The concern that I have chosen to put before you is uh, growing inequalities and sustainable development. Can we have anything to get from the Gandhi for this. When you take the point sustainable development, it has become a fashion after UNDP uh, and UN resolution, say global community resolution, that we have 17 sustainable development goals and after uh, some of years earlier we had the millennial, eight millennial development goals of the global community. Later we have now uh, 17 development goals where we are trying to achieve it by 2030. And then we are saying development and it has become passion everywhere we are talking anything with sustainability. My problem is that are we going to sustain what we have with us or we are really interested in sustainability. If you are really interested in sustainability, I found uh, one formula from Ishabashu Mission. Vedaranya Upanishad, that is Ishabashu Upanishad, uh, in Santi part it comes that means zero plus zero is equal to zero, zero minus zero is equal to zero. If you put mathematically, so simple. So how can we think of, as rightly Dr. Prasanna 
was searing when he was saying that when hands came, and doing a little extension of that, if, if that limbs goes to the technology and I start exploiting the nature without any rationality, where we have learned up now? And then, if we are in crisis, then we are looking back to Gandhi for a solution. First thing that came in my mind is, Gandhi is not a piece of idea. If you have to take Gandhi, you can't take comfortable part of Gandhi and leave the other parts. And that is a very uh, crucial one. It's not only government. Whole development process, if you talk of it, whenever they are in crisis and they want to get solution to say others that, look, you have not to do these things. And let us go with these things. That means if there is carbon emission, so let the developed nations contribute highest carbon emission and the benefits of luxury. And the, let the poor suffer. And the reports, series of reports come where it says that the contribution to carbon emission is very, very less with the poor. Take World Bank report 2024, take PKT's report 2022 and letters. On the one side, the inequality in distribution of uh, income and wealth is growing. Carbon emission is also growing equally with a positive relation. The luxurious people, luxurious society, luxurious lifestyle that emits, that are the more contributors of carbon footprint and poor are the less. If this is the stock of uh, or the outcome of this development that you have, and then you have a concern of sustainability of development, I say no. Gandhi is not a solution. Because Gandhi cannot say that you can consume irrationally and then take answer from Gandhi. It's not that. It's a different way of life. And it cannot be in peace. It is an integrated integrated way of life, a world view, which stops you to be luxurious, which stops you to be irrational, which stops us to consume mindlessly. Now question comes, where we have reached, are we ready to go back? Technology has its own nuances. It provides the skills. It, it, it gives comforts. It lessens drudgery. But at the same time, it creates side effects of the other destruction as well, where the balances of uh, nature has to do something wrong. And in such a situation, if we have to understand, are we ready to listen Gandhi? I say no. We are trying to listen Gandhi when we are in crisis. But remind Gandhi, uh, recall Gandhi uh, before independence in uh, early 30s, young India writings. When he was warning us that the industrialism is going to be a curse. He did not say industrialization is going to be a curse. Industrialism is going to be a curse. And inevitably it will lead to exploitation of the nations. And if India goes to that line, And then he says that the future of Europe is dark. 
will it not be darker for us? And we asked him what? But he did not listen. If we try to listen Gandhi, that means we have to listen his criticism, his critique of industrialism. We are not ready. We feel comfortable uh, with uh, ACs, with comfortable lives, with good amount of electricity. And then we want to say that, uh, is there any answer from Gandhi? It's not. To me it appears that if you have to understand Gandhi, Gandhi when himself started unfolding, he started unfolding with visiting Indian villages. He said, away all the clothes, he had only one. From Champaran Satyagraha to Vardoli and other places, I don't want to repeat those things. Everywhere the lessons. Now, since the matter has come to conclusion, it has been asked by the organizers, I know the pressure of time. Forget everything. Can we begin anything? If we have to think of. My mind comes that when uh, Gandhi came to Champaran, he gave us two lessons. How did he start? He started understanding people. He started documentation. He asked uh, uh, Rajendra Babu and Anugrah Babu and Prashkishore Babu to declass him. He asked their uh, um, uh, servants to go. And when Anugrah Babu said that uh, I don't know how to bake my bread. And he said, you have to learn so long you are not doing, I will bake. I'm ready to have that discipline. That means creative cadres. We have been listening about the Satyagraha and Satyagrahis. <coughs> Talking is very easy. But to become a Satyagrahi, I salute those Gandhians who are here they have been in practice for decades and they are trying to understand the conflicts, they are trying to be with the people with their all limitations. They are not demigod, they cannot do everything. But they are trying their best they can do uh, in this society. I am not appreciating them for self-consolation. Uh, but if one has to go for any sacrifice, one has to look into the ground reality as well. And to me, it looks like that, that anything is to be started, it can be started through education. Gandhi started Nai Tali. Jamparan Satyagraha was the beginning, documentation. And then why farmer did not agitate that means there is lack of proper education and he started schools. And it's not a school of walls, it is a school of experiments, through experiments. And therefore, varieties of schools. So I cannot say you to go, to, go back to 1930s. What I am saying now, are we ready to reinvent and understand Gandhi in the present context? Had Gandhi been here today, what could have been the action? Can we sit together to find out the action plan instead of asking others, can we start myself? Can I start myself? That is the issue. And in such situation, to me it appears that nothing is impossible. If you will start with education, we can have education for Satyagrahi as well. We can, we can have education for child who is coming up to become a good citizen later. What kind of education? Again, that is a big question. It's not that you can just imitate something from the others. 
localized, situation specific framework can be created and through which we can let us build that. Never is too late. You can start from the scratch and we can move forward. I am not disappointed. I think that at this stage when we have lots of crisis, the crisis is much more than what we had at the colonial rule. Now we have, we have the dismantled democratic institutions. The other things are equally in a bad shape. Our institutions are attacked. Be it Sabarmati, be it Sarvisheva Sangh has been demolished. Our own elected government is not going with the cause of the people. Gandhi said idleness is the root cause. Employment and poverty reduction is the first. That is not in agenda at all now. You have Hindu Rashtra in agenda. And Hindu Rashtra doesn't need a job. It needs a temple. Therefore, we have to think of a framework where we can start education to create citizens. We are creating machines in terms of educated institutions where we appreciate that this institution has high placement rate. Where are human beings in that placement? We have ATM cards. Instead of human beings, we have the ATM cards who give the better packages. Let us build those institutions. Can we revisit Bardha conference? Can we come back from there till date? What we have lost, where we are now, and how can we move forward? Perhaps the question of inequality, question of equality, perception, Buddha, Kabir, or Bashwa, or anybody else, perceptions are there. Can we convert them into consciousness? Unless perceptions are converted into consciousness through material conditions, through education, through putting the people into a struggle, can we begin with education? Thank you so much for giving me the same hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Devakarji, for sharing with us the link between our unsustainable lifestyles and relating it to Gandhian philosophy and also stressing on the importance of education. Next, we have with us uh, on the topic of Gandhi for Sustainable and Equitable Development, Sri Uttam Kumar Sinha, who has joined us today from Delhi. Sri Uttam Kumar Sinha has dedicated over 30 years to promoting Gandhian ideology and conducting... Yeah, 